you know, I think it was Shakespeare said, all shades of opinion feed an open mind. And I think to expand people's, uh, you know, both uh, thoughts on this uh, subject of uh, population and its, its, its you know, uh, challenges, and, and also to be able to um, be able to talk about that and give permission to talk about that and to find a voice in talking about it and actually taking action, whether that's, you know, educating their friends and families and the public uh, on you know, uh, infinite growth in population and consumption and its destructive effects. Terry Spar is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Terry is the executive director of Earth Overshoot, a nonprofit dedicated to making nature and its resources central to all personal and public decision-making through targeted education and advocacy. Terry is a filmmaker, naturalist, and environmental activist, is an expert on sustainability and the intersection of human consumption and population as the primary drivers of environmental destruction. Terry is the producer of the 2020 documentary, Eight Billion Angels which establishes the connection between unsustainable population growth and our global environmental emergencies, including climate change. Through compelling stories, the film lifts the veil on a critical topic often purposely neglected uh, to the shadows of our personal, political, and international conversations. Terry is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania College of Arts and Science and the Fell Center of Government. He has had a 25 year career in the insurance investment and real estate industries, and is the former board member of the Long Foster Companies, as well as their philanthropy arm, a sought after speaker. He has presented at numerous conferences, forums, spoken on the radio, podcasts, and is a contributor to the environmental pub publications and blogs all over. Terry, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you could make it. Great to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. I, I'm glad that you reached out. I was watching in afar uh, of your documentary. I have watched it fully and watched the obviously the trailer numerous times, but I watched the documentary twice. Thank you for that. Um, beautifully made. I have to give you kudos and, and really say, you know, when for documentaries, you've 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 done it in, in a good way where it's really not only pleasing to the eyes and watch the nature, the scenery, the way you do it. Um, but I don't have to immediately have a heart attack or bury my head in the sand that we're just all doomed to gloom, that there is some hope of optimism and, and for for what we need to do and some actionable things down the line. You've been doing this for a long time. You're very passionate about um, uh, science, environment, you, 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 uh, sustainability. Uh, how in the hell have you weathered this crazy pandemic, Black Lives Matters, people of color, Asian racism, Brexit? Uh, uh, I could go on and on. The pandemic, the lockdowns, the, the injustices and crazy things playing out in our world. Um, with, with all this experience, all the things you've been talking about doing your nonprofit, has that any, given you any resilience, any, any things to weather the storm and this craziness? How have you been? Well, uh, I would say there's a lot coming at us. There always has been. It's just obviously uh, changed over, over generations. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I need to update our uh, press release there that you read because... Uh, it said uh, a 2020 film, and we actually, as a, a as a casualty of COVID, we were supposed to uh, do our world premiere and, and, and release of it last year, this time, May of last year, and uh, uh, we had to postpone that, and we just released the film two weeks ago during Earth Day week. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you have to, I guess, uh, be resilient, as you said, Mark, and, and pivot and uh, adapt, and uh, we certainly did that, and a lot of other people have done that in, in, in many businesses and, and in their lives. I did a documentary with Jim Raketas called Now, uh, Greta Thunberg and a bunch of other greats. Muhammad Yunus, a Nobel laureate, was in it. And 
And uh, same thing. So I, I kept teasing and said, they shouldn't call it now. Let's call it later or yesterday or, or forgotten because it was also supposed to be launched in 2020. Matter of fact, right before the pandemic, they were scheduled to go with premieres and theaters and everything. Um, and then it just throws us off. And so that in, in, in and of itself is kind of not just a pivot, but uh, that that entire film documentaries, not all were prepared to be streaming, to be online, to, to find some other models. Um, did, were there any learning lessons in that? But also uh, what I'm really looking for, and I'm kind of leading you in a bit, all this, all these years you've been talking about this, there's obviously data and, and, and um, a lot of factual stuff behind that, but it's also a kind of a, for someone who preaches it or talks about it should be a lifestyle. Has any of that helped you with this craziness, weathering this or learning about pivots or have you had any resilience because maybe you applied some of those things you've talked about in your life and in the documentary that, that helped you weather this pandemic more. And then now that you did release on Earth Day, are you seeing people saying, God, this is exactly what we needed to, to get us through this craziness. And, and now we have a little more understanding and maybe we might have more actions or we might do something to help some of these issues we're facing. Well, I, I know that you, uh, Mark, are a, a sort of a, a big thinking systems thinker. You know, uh, I, I read your CV, the you know, dynamic systems model or with a understanding of science and maths. And, and one of the things that uh, I've observed over my lifetime, and I'm, I don't know your age, but I'm 55. And uh, what I have uh, seen in my short life is, is substantial, uh, you know, changes. They're slow moving, but substantial changes to our you know, our world uh, and its environment. And uh, uh, whether it's uh, the, the fisheries, and you know, we used to go to Maine every every year as a child. And uh, I still go back now, you know, 50 years later, and, and they're just uh, hardly any fish in the oceans. We used to catch them abundantly. The, you know, the, the shorelines are filled with plastics and all kinds of detritus. And, uh, you know, the tides are a lot higher. They just truly are. And that's a, a, actually in the last decade, we've really seen that. So, you know, there are these changes. And I think what uh, is frustrating and what I saw was that, you know, no one really wanted to discuss, you know, this, um, you know, this issue that is obviously, you know, relegated, as, as, as you said in the, in, the, in the introduction to the sort of the shadows of our discussions politically and internationally and personally. And that is that we have too many people consuming too many resources and emitting too many wastes. We have this, you know, human impact crisis, uh, Mark. And then as far as coming out with the film, I mean, were, were there some things that you, you had a different plan or strategy on how, how to release that and, and operate and get out to the people? And then through the pandemic, there was some, some right. pivots or things. What can you tell us about yeah. that? You know, absolutely. We were set for a, um, a, a, a you know, in-person uh, North American uh, release in theaters uh, across uh, North America. And uh, that was scheduled for May, and and we had to pull the plug, you know, basically end of March on that whole, uh, you know, um, plan of action, and uh, sat back and and uh, sort of watched the landscape unfold as we all did, and uh, you know, uh, finally decided that the, you know, uh, I guess it was probably the, the turn of the turn of the, you know, December, January, the new year here that we. Uh, felt it was uh, uh, you know urgent to get our message out, and we didn't want to wait, and we just uh, saw that people going back to theaters probably won't even happen until you know this fall even. So uh, here we are May and uh, I don't think uh, we're gonna still see people really gather, you know, even though we're getting you know decent penetration in this country and some other countries as far as the vaccine. So we uh, rolled it out two weeks ago to, you know, I think a, a tremendous reception, which was fantastic. And it was virtually uh, done. Yeah, I love that, 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 that was wonderful. So a fitting day, Earth Day and uh, from, the comments and responses I read uh, following that, uh, the, it was very positive, uh, well received um, overall. I'm sure I'm sure not everybody was was pleased, and there, there are some shocking moments or some things where you feel, oh, um, you know, there. I I want to I don't want to give away the the documentary. I, I really want to, people to go and watch it. I want them to figure out. Um, you know, what's the most convenient way and watch it. But I do want to tease it a little bit and, and give them a little bit of insight. But I want to go even more deeper. 
a little bit almost behind the scenes, data, wisdom, things like that, see if there's certain connections. So I've been doing this for, for a while. And, and uh, matter of fact, uh, it hasn't been released yet, but I uh, had probably one of your colleagues or maybe an acquaintance that you might know from um, the ecological footprint, Matas Wackernagel. He was on the podcast um, just two weeks ago, and we had a, a fairly deep dive and actually <laughs> went over it, went up probably about two and a half hours podcast, so we're going to have to trim it down. But it, it's based a lot on what he does, you know, Earth Overshoot Day. And today, is, today the day we're recording this, just as for my listeners, is Germany Overshoot Day, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Welcome uh, you know, normally a day I celebrate and um, uh, uh, in some respects because I love that culture and, and food and, and things, but uh, not a lot of celebration uh, for, for Germany. May 5th, four months, five days, they've already hit overshoot day, the day they're gone beyond their finite resources for Germany. My, and we're gonna, I'm going to ask you this into it, but... WTF? What? Uh, what in the heck? Where are we at? What? What's going on here? Um, you know, we're not even halfway into the year, and they've already used all their resources. So there's there's some glaring things going on, and my my question and caveat with Matthias and and Earth Overshoot Day. How much of uh, you also have, I mentioned your nonprofit, you have Earth Overshoot, uh, and uh, how are they involved? How is the data? How do you hold, get your statistics and, and things? Maybe we can kind of take a peek behind the scenes a little bit on, on where you get your data and calculations. Um, uh, Mathis and I have known each other for a while, and uh, you know his, his uh, nonprofit, uh, Global Footprint Network, does really good work. And uh, they, as you said, Mark, they, they assess you know bio capacity, uh, which is our you know our the biomass that we have, our fish, our plants, our you know uh, renewable resources, and uh, our use of them. And uh, uh, you know, are we able to live within what our country can provide us, or are we exceeding that uh, carrying capacity? I mean, we're basically, you know, uh, uh, chewing into the, uh, you know, to the to the reserves that we have. And yes, today is actually uh, overshoot day for uh, Germany. Uh, 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 Mathis's Global Footprint Network has some very good assessments for every country. They do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, data crunching from UN figures. Uh, the FAO uh, and and there are some other assessment organizations as well that look at you know bio capacity or, or ecological carrying capacity, but I think they are probably one of the better ones. So yeah, we like their data. We use that. We're separate from them, uh, but uh, we're more on the educational side. Uh, but uh, you know they have their Earth Overshoot Day in which they say here's a day which with this country or the or even the globe you know, starts to exceed its carrying capacity and starts, you know, using more than just the interest, uh, you know, they're, they're digging into the principle. So yes, we, um, uh, we collaborate and uh, I like their work and uh, it's, it's an important part of trying to measure, you know, as Matt has probably said, measure what we treasure. Yeah, exactly. He actually did say that. Um, a lot of this, so he's been doing it about 30 years now. It really started out with his, uh, PhD thesis, and he he worked a lot with um, a couple people. So Bert Byers, and he also uh, um, worked with uh, William Z. Reese, uh, who was his mentor and thesis and things. And I don't want to talk too much about him, but a lot of that, the ideas and the thought process behind that direction comes from Herman Daly uh, um, writings, comes from Kenneth Boulding's writings, comes from Dana Meadows, Dennis Meadows, your grander, Steve Barron's Jr. at the limits to growth, you know, world model three kind of modeling and, and systems dynamic modeling where we get some of these, not only the global hectare, but bio capacity data. And there's almost an equation and way to calculate the data. And so I wanted to know, is, is that kind of also how, how you do it or how? Because in, in the film as well, you or in the documentary, you um let's let's just be on, honest and i said it in your bio it's, there's not a lot of talk and there's a lot of skirting around population growth you know facing 9 billion 10 billion in the future 2050 uh wh where we're going and and how that affects 
an unsustainable planet, a planet that uh, is kind of living beyond its natural resources. But I want to, I, I get the feeling, and maybe I missed it, but there wasn't a lot of talk about that because it's kind of more an educational transition to get people to view things and see what where we've kind of gone over, like you mentioned, the fishing in Maine and, and things. Um, but how did how did that journey start? I guess how did you get into that? And 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 uh, tell us a little bit more into that. I would like to get get a little bit deeper. Well, I think uh, when you look at uh, the symptoms that are out there, Mark, uh, and you know the again the the you know, work that Mathis does and and uh, other assessment organizations, we are seeing basically every planetary system uh, uh, failing and. Uh, uh, you know, climate change is is very real and it's very big and it's in the news every day and rightly so. But it is, you know, just one symptom of multiple symptoms that are afflicting our planet. You have the, you know, the the, the degradation of our soils. You know, the fertility loss in our soils and the erosion of our soils has been dramatic since uh, World War II, since the 50s. Uh, you know, aquifers and rivers and lakes are being drained globally. You know the uh, the, the deforestation, we're losing essentially net forest of about, you know, the size of Greece every year. And uh, you're seeing the pollution everywhere, you know, across our lands and our waterways and throughout our airways. And uh, we see it with the species extinction loss, you know, billions of animals a year are being exterminated. And, uh, you know, when you look at all these symptoms in their totality, they, they do paint a much larger crisis. And, and that is that there are too many of us, you know, consuming too many resources. And that gets back to this equation that, you know, the Bill Reeses of the world who you mentioned, the Mathis is using all ecologists. And that is that, you know, it's uh, our impact on the planet is a factor of the number of us population times our affluence. Our affluence is our wealth mark. And that wealth or that affluence is really our income and it's our assets. And, uh, you know, the, the challenge we have is that, you know, all these films and a lot of these, uh, you know, environmental organizations are solely focusing on you know, our consumption, which, you know, falls under part of that affluence. We, we produce goods and we consume goods and that's our total wealth. Uh, and they're only focusing on that. And the challenge is it's very, very, very difficult to reduce our affluence. You know, um, you know Germany, and, and as a good example, with an earth overshoot day today, you know, um, you know to, to get to a, 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 a essentially a sustainable Germany, uh, you would have to, the country, the residents there would have to reduce their affluence, their wealth by about two thirds. It's dramatic. I mean, can, can you imagine changing your lifestyle, basically eliminating two thirds of your income and two, two, two thirds of your wealth? It's just, it's, it's it practically impossible. When you look at it on a global level, it's, 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 it's an enormous challenge. So um, uh, that's why uh, the film is there to introduce this other part of the equation saying, you know, we do need to you know, discuss you know, this issue of unsustainable population growth, it's, it's very, it's very real and very present. And it really is, as you saw in the film, uh, malleable, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's influenceable in a way that is, you know, uh, with wonderful, uh, you know, uh, human health results and wonderful social health results and environmental justice results. Um, boy, we, we can really go deep already. So I love, I love your response. I'm, I, I thank you. Um, I, I want to ask, um, kind of another bigger bigger question and uh and then go back into a little bit more uh more data and 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 wisdoms that have existed out there for a while there's this there's this big discussion about you know not only globalization but uh global citizenry do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel if you lived on a world that was without nations, borders, divisions of man, human beings for one from another. Um, and do you think that is something on, on the spaceship Earth that that we could achieve and reach? Or what are your thoughts and feelings on, on that? Um, I think we all have to deal with life as it is, not how we might like it to be. And uh, it, you know, that might be a, a nice idealistic uh, vision, but uh, I think there's just too much self-interest and too much culture and too much history that you would ever see, you know, even, uh, you know, you see uh, merging of certain regions and it uh, oftentimes ends up in lots of conflict and civil conflict and, and wars. So I don't see that happening. Uh, we can certainly, you know, cooperate better and uh, 
uh, hopefully through education, understand our impacts that we are having with each other. And, you know, you know the United States and Germany are, you know, two countries that, you know, are highly reliant on, you know, massive imports and imports that are coming from a lot of these developing countries. And uh, we're, you know, causing a, and inflicting a significant amount of environmental damage in these other countries because of our you know, voracious appetite for all the materials and resources and energy that we need to, you know, live, uh, you know, what we consider a, a, a good lifestyle. I, I totally agree. And, and um, th thanks for answering that. I mean, uh, it's a hard and I don't want to, I don't by no means want to put you on the spot. I really believe that this commodity global trade um, companies, co organizations are, have really been global for for decades already kind of working uh, uh, even during the pandemic. So pa during the pandemic, um, unbelievable how, you know, humanity was kind of stuck in, in four walls or behind borders and locked down. But uh, food, air, water, soil, species uh, still still found its way around. And uh, there was a, a big re recoil to more local, more regional but also that big impact was felt on how strong our, our, our global ties are to, to many other uh, areas, you know, and uh, especially with the vaccine production, especially with um, um, different things that, you know, we're, we're seeing emerge out. And so there's, there, there's, there's that aspect of it, but there's this other aspect that I'm kind of, uh, this division of humanity one from other doesn't really exist uh, uh, except for on a national level we've become during this time kind of very nationalistic and well, one against each other saying you know well if the Ch chinese don't do this if the, if brazil doesn't do this and 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 uh it's it's kind of dividing ourselves from from each other and we're all kin that's the crazy thing you know um we're all distant cousins we're all kin and and uh, um Carl Sagan really said it nicely. He said, you know, there's this consciousness emerging that sees the, the earth, the world as a single organism and an organism divided amongst itself or fighting against itself is doomed. And, uh, um, and, and that goes back, I mean, to what the way you answered it is that we're kind of, you don't see humanity coming together and being able to do that, that we're too strong and consume in, in this whatever you want to call it, capitalism, this uh, other uh, form of uh, influence or uh, how, how we look at it. But uh, that could also be defined as the human condition. Uh, do you have any thoughts or feelings about this human condition? Why, are, why are, are we kin and cousins, homo sapiens, yet we can't align with each other on a common path forward? Is money so powerful? Is capitalism so powerful? Is consumerism so powerful? Uh, that, I, that's a deep question, Mark. And uh, I, I want to go I, deep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, I'm not a psychology major, but uh, certainly self-interest plays a role. I think uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, what's the what's the uh, uh, pyramid that uh, I'm, I'm Maslow's this. hierarchy needs. Thank you. Maslow's hierarchy of needs that, you know, we all you know, need safety, security, food, shelter, clothing, the basics of life and, uh, you know, or we'll die. And we need 2000 calories a day, basically on a consistent basis, or we'll die. So, um, I, I, and I, we have a deep desire to procreate. And that's, it's, it's, it's a, that's certainly an innate thing. So I think, um, you know, um, self-interest is plays a role, and, and that self-interest, when organized in societies and civilizations, uh, creates, as you said, sort of a superorganism of self-interest within a, a region or a country. And then you've got the entire superorganism of all these varying self-interests that you know are basically you know, state-run, and then you have the individuals within those states that are have self-interest. So. Uh, I, 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 you know, I don't know if we'll be able to change that, uh, you know, uh, to, to much of a degree that would make us all cooperate all the time. There have been, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess murders and deaths and, and wars fought for for ever since there was civilization. So it's, uh, I, I don't, I, I, I just hope and pray that we all are educated enough to understand the consequences now, especially in a global world with global, you know, uh, armaments that you know, can annihilate a lot of, you know, our, our humanity. 
Back in um, 2015, I was given a lecture at a couple of colleges at Oxford, and um, I was uh, well, after after I, I was done, I was approached by <clears throat> um, a, a couple of people that uh, some 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 statements and support from Jane Goodall and from uh, David Attenborough came out uh, really on population and. Um, it's a sensitive subject. It's a it's a people's uh, tempers, eyes. Uh, I I mean, it's just uh, you know you see a, a, a physical change when that when that comes up, and uh, I was really surprised that uh, Jane Goodall came out with a video statement talking about it. She has several times. She's in uh, I believe in the first part of of your film as a documentary as well. Uh, saying some very interesting things, and then David Attenborough as well. Um, besides the the uh, ecological footprint data, which is based off bio capacity, which is based off of global hectare, um, different sources of data, is there is there something else pushing that that discussion, or were that where we come up and we, we want to talk about that, or or um, I think that's a great question is, is, is what's pushing that discussion and why is this pendulum swinging towards, you know, having this conversation about unsustainable population growth. And I, I think what the challenge has been is that, you know, the past 40 years, uh, it's, it's been in, it's been in the closet, it's been in the back seat, and everything that we've been doing for the past 40 years has, hasn't worked. And, you know, every symptom that I mentioned is getting worse at, at a global level, Mark. So, you know, do we keep repeating the same thing over and over again and expect to get different results? Because that's, you know, the definition of insanity. So I think uh, there is a, a growing recognition that we, we do need to have an honest conversation about our numbers and the impact they're having. I, I also think if you really study the, you know, again, back to that equation, the impact equals the number of us times our affluence. If we study the wealth side of it and the, and the you know, consumption, um, it's, it's, and I mentioned, it's extremely difficult to reduce our overall consumption. I think, you know, the COVID is a very good sort of uh, uh, example of, of that challenge. You know, COVID uh, in 2020, uh, we saw, you know, the global economy contract by about 5%, um, you know, a substantial uh, financial hit for, you know, many families, uh, businesses, countries, uh, let alone the health, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, travesty. So five percent is uh, was was you know uh, a, a a pretty substantial hit, and when we look at you know Mathis's and Global Footprint Networks uh, you know work that they've done as far as analyzing you know our bio capacity, we would need to reduce our total uh, economic activity, our total consumption mark by about fifty percent in order to live sustainably long term as a global society. Uh, and so imagine we'd have to basically have a, a you know a, a retraction in the economy about ten times worse than what COVID delivered to us involuntarily. It's it's just it's enormous and it's just it's 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 un it's it's just not going to happen. So uh, you know that's one of the biggest challenges with reducing our consumption. Is no one really wants to do it because you know when you look at what a sustainable lifestyle looks like, Mark, and I think you'll find this kind of fascinating. I've you know I've taken again the global footprint num networks numbers and, and other assessments from other organizations. Um, a if we were to live equitably, you know, almost eight billion of us, uh, that lifestyle would look like essentially each and every one of us living in a, a a small bedroom, maybe twelve by twelve feet, with a small bed in one corner and a small kitchen in the other, with a tiny little stove and a tiny little refrigerator, and maybe one outlet to plug our cell phone in, and maybe one switch for a light, and it would have me not having any central air, no central heat, no central hot water. No washer or dryer or 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 or, or, or a, you know dishwasher because you only have a couple sets of clothes and a couple pairs of shoes and just a few sets of tableware, and it would be never eating fish or meat, uh, only having a plant based diet and a local one at that, and never driving in a car and never flying in an airplane. That is essentially a sustainable lifestyle for us, for you know globally, if we're going to you know live equitably, you know, with all of us. And the challenge is you've got three and a half billion people, including you and me, who are living way above that sustainable level. And how do we get these people who are in scores of countries around the globe 
uh, coming from all different kinds of cultural you know, backgrounds, political backgrounds, you know, economic uh, situations. How do we get them to simultaneously and voluntarily you know, reduce their material standards of living by 50 to 90%? You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. Uh, and, and the other challenge is the four and a half plus billion who are living below that sustainable threshold uh, and the, you know, the bioethicist in the bioethicist in the film brings this up. He says, you know, we should give them the space to, to grow and to consume more and to, and to, you know, live better lives because it's a social justice issue. And, you know, he's right. So, you know, we've got a real conundrum here where you've got, you know, the wealthier people who are living above that sustainable threshold who have no interest or very little interest in trying to reduce their wealth to that level. And the people who are living below that sustainable threshold, you know, want to live better lives and should have the right to do so. So it's, it's a real challenge. In the documentary, you um, take us to India and you take us on uh, uh, very eye-opening. I've been to India several times and, and um, it's a, it is an eye opener, but the, I mean, there was times where, uh, you know, three weeks, I didn't see the sun once. Uh, I felt like I was uh, locked into a smoking chamber in the airport or into some kind of a confined room of smokestacks. Just, I just, it was horrific. And, uh, you know, see people living and functioning, but there's a little boat ride that occurs there. And we're looking at basically open sewage, black water, you know, um, <clears throat> truly black water. And, and um, it's an eye opener, but uh, uh, on, a, on a country uh, that is uh, has huge population, huge numbers, and um, just seems, uh, in some respects, it can feel hopeless. What, what the heck are we gonna do? How, how can we fix these problems? And, and why haven't we started sooner? Um, there, uh, I, I loved it and it was an eye opener. It would drive me to action. I hope it wouldn't make uh, others d do otherwise. And I think the way it was done was very, very, uh, uh, uh honest and, and, uh, ethically. Okay. It was, uh, it was, it was reality, but it wasn't like, okay, just forget it. You might as well give up today. Um, which I like. But that there, there's some really crazy schools of thought or different schools of thought, I, I guess, how we could do them. Steve Pinker in his book, Enlightenment Now, um, as well as Hans Rosling and, and a couple others to present data and, and, and talk, say, actually, you know, we're going to see the numbers kind of level out and take a dip. We were not going to go above 9 billion. And as India comes up, as Africa comes up, China comes up, uh, we're going to see kind of a bend the curve, population's going to kind of level out as, as people reach that affluence and, and have different lifestyles that uh, we hear that that one version or those versions of, of um, they're almost predictions, you know, that's what they're seeing and predicting on how it's going to go. And I hope most of those are done off of uh, dynamic modeling and, and uh numerous endless amounts of scenarios to get a high probability that that is highly likely. Um, but then it comes back to this thing is, as we look around us, whether we're in the developed world or in, uh, in an undeveloped world uh, or country, um, I just don't see the infrastructure getting up to speed. I just don't see us providing that global hectare, that bio capacity for each individual to, to live on that footprint that we're lagging behind. But, it, but in that is my question. I do, I do believe there's a hint of truth that if we could bend that curve and get our infrastructures and efficiency get not just on renewables, but how we live differently, that, that we could actually live on the, the, the Earth overshoot is calculated on a global hectare, 1.6 global hectares, which is replicable. And the reason we have earth overshoot, because on a global average, we're 2.98, something like that, global hectares, which is a deficit of one point something global hectares per person. And so the, 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 the reason I bring that up uh, um, is that's almost... Um, 
not business as usual, but that's a high carbon scenario. That's us consuming uh, unbelievable ways because we're actually consuming more than we have. We're not living in planetary boundaries. But what if we had a better operating system? What if we had a, a society that says we'll never let humanity get below poverty and hunger and suffering? We set the bar higher. We, we, we build better infrastructures and we think not just replicable hectares of what's available, what we have with our carrying capacity of, of humanity and the growth of humanity, which that would fluctuate daily. But what if we started to update our, our infrastructures and, and provide everybody with the basic needs and provide it in a way that is seasteading, going vertical, being more efficient with passive homes and renewable energy and solid infrastructures? Even with that, do you think we could bend that curve and like Steve Pinker and 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 uh, uh, Hans Rosling said, you know, kind of that that it's going to be a different scenario. Or are are you set and firm that you just don't have hope in us? Or can give us some looks into your mind and those involved in in the documentary and 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 tell us a little bit more how how you present it, why you feel we're going this other way. And I promise we're going to get out of this uh, kind of. The, the deep end and, and the more solutions that you present more towards the, the later half of the documentary and and how there is some hope and what we can do. And it's not, you know, uh, what some people might be thinking, but I don't want to spoil it too much. I want you to tell us about that. I, I'm fine with you sort of, uh, uh, you know, talking about the film. I, I think um, what we helped to try and uh, see, uh, you know, or help the viewers understand is that um, addressing the, the population issue is not something we should fear. And, uh, you know, it's, it's deeply moral, it's deeply fundamental, excuse me, fundamental to uh, what I would say is grow smaller gracefully. And, uh, you know, when you, uh, and, and it's interesting, you mentioned India, you know, here's a country with, a, I think it's like 1.3 billion people now. And the politician in the film there, who was uh, one of the you know, uh, most well-known politicians in India speaks, he says, you know, uh, it, the, the, the challenges that we're seeing with, as you said, the polluted river and the polluted airs are, are you know, incredibly uh, uh, difficult. They're intractable is the word he used because uh, they come from so many various sources and so many people putting pressure on the environment for just basic living. And he said, imagine if, if Mark, if we, uh, you know, uh, were just to get everybody electricity to improve their lives by providing electricity to the 200 million plus Indians who do not have access to electricity. He said, that's gonna create even more pollution and more you know, uh, damage to the environment. And that's the, that's the, that's the conundrum is that you've got, you know, the more that we improve people's lives, the more damage we cause to the environment. And, uh, but we need to do that. So how can we do that? We can certainly try our best, as you said, to, 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 to you know, uh, not be as uh, polluted. And uh, what we find is oftentimes it gets shifted, it gets shifted to other countries. So the United States has done a good job of cleaning up its environment. But as a result, we lost a lot of that manufacturing here because it became expensive to manage that. And we pushed it offshore to other countries that didn't have those environmental protections. So it gets shifted. And that's a, that's a, that's a, a challenge that needs to be addressed. And it's not an easy thing to deal with because we're not one global society. Um, so I, I, I guess that's a sort of a, a you know, my thinking is, uh, and my thoughts are that uh, I, I hope we can flatten the curve when it comes to uh, our, our population growth. We're adding about 80 million people a year. And, you know, they all need, they need clean water, they need, you know, food, they need uh, shelter, they need clothing. And, you know, those resources, uh, uh, you know, they do cause uh, an impact on the environment. Uh, any, any, any organism, no matter how benign, you know, uh, impacts the environment around it. And uh, so we, we have to recognize that uh, the sooner that we can uh, flatten that curve and start to, you know, gradually reduce our numbers, uh, the better we, the better we'll be off. And what's interesting is in India, again, you look at how that has happened there, they're continuing to grow, you know, they have, I think they're replaced, they're, they're not a replacement yet, but they're about 2.4 children per woman, uh, per woman. And uh, there is a, part in the film where we're down in Kerala, Mark, if you recall, that's the state, the okay. southern state of India. And uh, what's fascinating there is when, you know, that, 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 that state for the last 200 years has educated girls and boys, and uh, not just, you know, young men, but women. And uh, they have uh, really made a priority to 
empower women, to educate them, to provide them good access to reproductive health care. And you know, their fertility rate down there is about 1.7 because when women are educated, you know, they tend to be in the workforce, they tend to be, uh, certainly improve their health, improve their living conditions. They have fewer children, they space them more uh, and their families and their lives are far, far better. And the environment actually begins to restore itself because there are fewer people putting that pressure on the environment for their basic needs. I absolutely love that part uh, of, the, of the documentary. Um, I say often that actually two of the biggest ways to draw down, as Paul Hawken as well said in this book, draw down is really to empower women and girls. And, and um, it's not just education, it's their basic needs, it's their lifestyle, that they're um, not married off at an early age, that they get that education, that they get those jobs and positions and that equality. So there's numerous different aspects of how that just flattens the curve, but also is a game changer for not only population growth, but better stewardship over families, better stewardship over our planet and how we do infrastructures much different. And, and um, I loved that. That was, you know, one of the most wonderful parts uh, of the documentary. The whole thing was wonderful. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I just want to kind of go a little bit deeper because I, I uh, um, I just don't watch to watch as entertainment. I watch to kind of educate as you're, you're an educator and you're the people you want to kind of present them with something they may, might not have heard before, but also might be taboo or not a subject that's uh, easily approached. And how, how do you do that? And you do it in such an eloquent way. You do it in, in the right way where it's, um, it's not difficult. Some of the numbers are really hard for humanity to fathom. We don't understand the exponential function. We don't understand these large uh, billions is, is just a, a, a hard for us to fathom. But uh, the way the, you mentioned how many people, how we're growing every year, um, to break that down, to have an infrastructure, and this is why I broached the subject of infrastructure. If we had some drastic, if, if we stop the high carbon scenario or business as usual, if we had infrastructure that provide the basic needs and the necessity of everybody, I think that that would also help bend the curve. But what, what does that mean? Well, the, the, the number you mentioned, what it means is we'd roughly need to build about 60,000 schools every single week just to keep up with that growth. One, we're far behind that. And two, we're not doing that every week to keep up with educating and growing just humanity. It doesn't matter women or girls, it's just period um, to educate everybody in the future. And so we're already building, building into the system, poverty, hunger, no education, you know, not just the Paris agreement, not just what's talked about in the IPCC, uh, um, not just the basic needs of humanity. We're just not doing it. So um <clears throat> That leads me to my next question, and I, I, if you don't want to broach it, we don't have to, but we, we're currently operating under a, a civilization framework, a global civilization framework, and there might be a few pockets of these civilization frameworks around the world um, um, that are there, um, but humanity is becoming at dis-ease, a little bit unrestful with our, our conditions around the world, with what's going on, not just the pandemic, but with Brexit, with the Amazon burning and Bolsonaro, with Putin, Shea, Duarte, Erdogan, whoever, you know, in the Trump apocalypse, the Oompa Loompa, and what, you know, the inauguration, people are dissatisfied. They're not, they're at ease. And uh, what happens is, uh, is, or is not clear with this big history kind of a picture, is we've had more than 20 civilization frameworks that don't exist anymore. And all but two of those 20 early Incas, uh, Aztecs, Mayas, early Mesopotamia, uh, Greeks, Romans, uh, ancient China, ancient Greece, on and on, 20, all but two don't exist because of ecological or environmental collapse. And they were pretty advanced civilizations. And no, they didn't have computers and satellites and go to the moon, but they were doing pretty good, I would say. Why did they collapse? And why would we feel that we won't collapse? And there's, um, 
the question is, do you see an emergence of a new civilization framework, something that will carry us beyond 2050, something that will work for all humanity? Do you feel that DCs as well? And is that why uh, another reason for the documentary or does that tie into anything what, 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 why you did the documentary and maybe share your feelings with us on that? Um, I, I think the challenges, and I don't know if it's hubris with uh, uh, human, uh, uh, you know, our, 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 the way we think and the way we live, but um, uh, we're no different than other species, Mark. Um, and as you said, uh, you know, 20 plus civilizations in the past have suffered from, uh, you know, uh, collapses primarily because of environmental issues, whether it's a, a lot of it was soil loss or you know, desertification or, or other or, or, or water issues as far as uh, scarcity. But um, I, um, you know, can we uh, forestall or uh, prevent a, a similar collapse now at a global level? Uh, because we have essentially exploded to every corner of the globe in just the past 150, 200 years, from you know going from a billion people in 1800 to 8 billion now. And yes, we can, because of fossil energy, deliver food and water everywhere. And we can deter practically every disease before it wipes us out. You know, COVID's going to obviously impact us, uh, you know, uh, our, our mortality numbers, but not to the degree that, that's going to really do much, uh, uh, you know, uh, long term. Um, but we, and we've done that with all these other diseases too, just because of the technologies that we've been able to create. So, you know, do we have the wisdom? We certainly are clever species, but do we have the wisdom to see this and recognize this and see that, you know, we are living far in excess of what the earth can provide us. And at some point there are going to be significant constraints and uh, as a result, conflict. And, uh, I, I hope we have that foresight. I hope we have that wisdom. I'm, you know, very concerned because it is a, a, a massive macro issue. I, I, I've read and studied and seen, uh, you know, estimates for the future. And you know, in, 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 by 2040, Mark, we're expected to have another, you know, billion plus people on top of what we have now. And those billion people consume annually three billion farm animals, and they're going to need a heck of a lot more land, which means we're going to have to. You know, uh, uh, you know, denude uh, a lot more forest to feed those, you know, animals so as far as pastures and crops for them. Um, we're expected to have, and this is from BP Energy, 30% uh, uh, more energy consumption. And they anticipate that half of that, it will still come from fossil energy. So, you know, we've got these enormous complex systems out there that exist. And uh, we, you know, and, and everything that I've read and studied and seen where we're heading, even if we can you know, reduce our fossil fuel use, uh, that, that doesn't mean we're reducing our material use. And uh, as you said, we need 60,000 more schools just for the next couple of weeks. Or well, I don't know the number. Of our just every teams. week. It's every week. It's, um, I mean, just to fathom it's, that, you know. And then, you know, the, the, the numbers I've seen is about 90 billion tons of, of minerals and metals and materials and energy, fossil energy and biomass that you know, we consume as a, as a global society annually, 90 billion tons. And, uh, you know, in 2060, the OECD, and I think it was the Global Status Report, uh, expected that to double as far as the amount of materials that we will be extracting from the earth, which will place even more enormous pressure on the environment. So uh, we have to recognize and be able to see in the future, and that's, you know, we are a species that has that ability to think abstractly, you know, will we do it? And will we have the wisdom and, and the ability to talk honestly as we're doing you and I about these you know big issues that also have a lot of sensitivity around them you know reproductive autonomy um, you know politics uh, religion you know go forth and multiply and that that might have been good back in you know a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago but it's a different world now and uh, it's uh, we have to you know, be able as a species uh, and a global society to talk about this and do it in a way that's you know ethical ethical and honest. I'm glad that I can have an ethical and honest and deep discussion about something so hard with you and you, you don't take a, a offense to my questioning. It's uh, none of it's ever a personal uh, attack. It's just I, I want to get all angles uh, of the story. I want to get all sides and understand it as best as possible. I'd love to remove bias. I'd love to get into uh, sense making just so that we can 
kind of take a step back for a second and have that overview effect that uh, cosmic perspective to understand are we getting the big history are we getting understanding it have we understood collective intelligence or are there some chunks that we don't know about or that we haven't read or haven't seen or are not educated in i mean obviously education is a big uh, issue regardless of that we're way behind on that a lot of people aren't getting that a lot of people don't have access to the the uh, the podcasts and, and the books that that we do or the data um, and so uh, we're in a we're definitely in a conundrum of, of where we need to move forward. And, and we have this thing that's real. It's kind of it's really funny. So I, I, I uh, Kate Rowworth, um, who does the donut economics, she, she surmised it very nicely. It's this weird societies. You know, it's where Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic and uh, it's here in these weird societies where most of the economic research is done uh, and thereby they're very biased. And they're also done by a lot of white male economists. There's not too many, you know, um, uh, that's that's the stereotypical, uh, you know, economists, these, the, the white males. And, and that's not typical to uh, a, a good diverse depiction of our globe, of our world, of all those people that we're discussing here now and um we, we need to get some more of this equality uh, um <clears throat> so i think we want to go just a little bit deeper if that's okay what what would you say um, um is the most important thing when somebody watches this documentary that, and I, I believe you've done it very nicely, that you want to convey to, to them what, what you, your hope to achieve um, with your message, with the documentary. And are you already seeing from Earth Day, are you already seeing that, that result starting to resonate with people? Um, I think, uh you and I and, and others who are uh, hope to be influencers, I, I, I find that, uh, and you know this as well, that emotion moves people, it's not statistics. And, um, you know, when you look at our film, we, we didn't have any graphs, we didn't have any narration, it was purely people uh, living and telling their stories, you know, some were scientists, but a lot of them were everyday people who uh, were in India or out there, the farmers in the Midwest. And, uh, or the the, the uh, you know oyster farmer up in Maine and uh, the, the the struggles that they're seeing and uh, and trying to live their lives and so I think uh, emotion is important and to try and connect with people emotionally and I think that was the the goal of the film was to help people expand as you said you know to to you know I think it was Shakespeare said all shades of opinion feed an open mind. And I think to expand people's, uh, you know, both uh, thoughts on this uh, subject of uh, population and its, its, its you know, uh, challenges, and, and also to be able to um, be able to talk about that and give permission to talk about that and to find a voice in talking about it and actually taking action, whether that's, you know, educating their friends and families and the public uh, on you know, uh, infinite growth in population and consumption and its destructive effects. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I think it's important for uh, us all to be able to be able to, you know, bring this to the, the forefront of our conversations and then address it because the sooner that we can, you know, reduce that curve, I think there'll be enormous, um, you know, justice for not only for, you know, humanity, but for the natural world. So, and the farmer in the Midwest that you mentioned, I, I think that's a perfect what you said, but I just brought up a thought of, uh, you know, I watched the documentary twice and, and there's this really unique point and that's what I liked about it. It's very, there's not a lot of bias in it. It's just showing all sides, the good, bad, the ugly. Um, and, uh, you know, the, this Midwestern farmer kind of says, you know, I, I don't, I can't remember if he says devil or evil. He says, I, I guess I'm the devil or I'm evil. I'm the evil one, the bad guy. Um, and, and, but there, there wasn't a set. It was up to us to decide based on the story and the journey we followed him on what he honestly told us and business as usual, or his operations is very honest, a nice guy, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, a, a good but soul. Then, 
Yeah, good but, soul. I mean, and and the story and a long history of farming in his family and, and how he got in. Very open, honest, uh, all cards on the table, so to say. And then he basically gave us, he says, you decide. He says, I, I kind of have this feeling, but you decide. And I just, I love that because, um, uh, you know, and there's, there's always two sides to the coin. There's also multiple stories, cultures, and ways to view. And, and um, sometimes these civilization frameworks, going back to what we discussed a few minutes ago, um, have set us up on the wrong path, have, set, uh, have not given us a lot of choice. Uh, um, we're kind of stuck in that hamster uh, uh, wheel for um, in certain certain aspects, you know, uh, we, we can only do so much. And so uh, I believe there are some tools. I believe there's through education and em empowerment, we can really change that. And, and you bring that on towards the, the end in, in a nice way. Um, I, I, I guess I'm at a different level. So I would even like more because I, I want to, I really want to have an impact. I want, I, I like, I'm going to go down kicking, screaming, fighting. I want to, I want to, you know, try to make things as good as possible. Um, and I think uh, it's really, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying that you mentioned the farmer and, you know, he, he said, he looked at the director and he said, am I good or am I evil? And yeah. uh, he was using what he said as a limited resource, which was the aquifer water for the farming. And uh, he's using it up faster than what is being replenished. And so he said, you know, uh, you know, should I be leaving it for future generations? And, uh, you know, it's interesting that he recognizes that. But, you know, we all we all do that in our daily lives from you know, the, the materials and resources that we use, uh, I, you know, it's just finished a really good book called Blip by uh, Chris Clugston. And um, have you heard of that, Mark? I have, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's really about all the non-renewable natural resources that we have and how we've essentially, you know, uh, you know denuded the lands. And, and now we're really struggling to find these resources, uh, especially in Europe, a little bit in America, and less so in China and less so in Russia. But uh, you know these are the big the big countries. But uh, they are limits, and there are limits to growth, as you were saying at the beginning of the podcast yeah. or the radio show. Uh, there sure and so, is. Uh, you know, I, I I hope that we can uh, model those uh, resources as a as a global society, at least from a country level, and you know prepare for um, you know their eventuality when they will run uh, low and uh, be able to pivot and and also be able to set. I would say, you know, the right expectations with society too, so that, you know, when we transition through overshoot, uh, you know, we, we maintain our, our happiness. We, we, you know, find the good in others and uh, we go through that process, uh, you know, uh, gracefully because uh, it's not easy to, you know, when, what happens when we have less energy, it's going to, you know, be difficult to adjust and that that will eventually happen. You know, the, the oil and the gas and the coal that's in the ground is not uh, limitless. And, uh, the studies that I've researched and read uh, says that the second half of this century, uh, there may be some significant implications on our, our, our energy reserves and, and being able to serve you know, society. And that'll drastically impact us. Absolutely. So the World Economic Forum is coming forward right now and, and um, or since the pandemic and really uh, they're in this modus, the great reset, that's the, the verbiage and, and um, that they're using that we need a great reset. Um, I mentioned Kate Rollworth earlier, Donut Economics, uh, Johan Rockström, Professor Johan Rockström, that's uh, Planetary Boundaries. He just came out with a new white paper. Uh, it's very interesting on our natural capital and natural resources. Um, um, there's the, the Green New Deal. Obviously, I'm biased. I, I believe strongly in the Paris Agreement, even before that in the Sustainable Development Goals as our 2030 not just agenda, I believe it's the, the, the world's first global moonshot, 197 countries for the first time ever decided on a plan of action, a roadmap of how to get to better futures with monies, backcasting, foresight, targets, indicators. And I, I re really, I don't see any other global kind of plan to improve poverty and, and gender equality, empowering women and girls, et cetera out there ever um and it's hardly even recognized nobody's speaking about it nobody's really kind of it's you know it's just a, a blip out there but 
that leads to my question what's the plan do you believe that there's a plan that there's like a the new green deal donut economic planetary boundaries the SDG is there some kind of a a a a, a, a great reset or a rescue plan a roadmap to the future that can maybe bend the curve flatten the curve get us to a better future I, I guess I would just pose this to your viewers uh Mark and you know there have been 34 international you know, climate conferences over the last 40 years. And if you and I and everyone else looks at uh, you know, the increasing CO2 emissions every year and the accumulation from parts per million, they keep going up and up and up and up. So again, do we continue to uh, you know, have these uh, you know, conclaves and, and uh, conferences and uh, you know, can we get together and do something? I think it's a, a significant challenge. I, I, I look at what happened in France a year or so ago when they tried to uh, uh, impo impose an additional carbon tax and uh, you had the basically the, the citizens revolt because of the, yeah, uh, you exactly. know, the additional cost. So I think it's gonna be a real challenge to, and we need to do it because we do need to get off carbon, uh, both for climate change, but also for the fact that we're not gonna have much in the ground maybe in 40 or 50 years. So we do have to find alternative energy. And uh, I think that's even more of a concern than, than or, or as much of a concern than, than, than climate change uh, as far as our, our energy use. So uh, I, will we make those changes? I, I, it hasn't happened yet. And I think we'll still see those numbers march as far as what those estimates were that I showed you from, or to share with you from BP uh and and population growth and the impact that's going to have on more energy need and more environmental damage so uh i think we have to have this conversation and it has to be on an international level that we all have to really look at do we need to have endless growth of population it's to me it's it's a, it's, it's a far healthier there are a lot of countries mark that are actually reducing their populations and they're doing it all voluntarily all ethically uh, all in a human rights context and they're seeing enormous, enormous improvements in, in, in the health and welfare of their citizens and, and the environment's beginning to restore. I mean, you look at Bulgaria, Lithuania, uh, Croatia, Japan, uh, these are all countries that are, are in this process. Uh, and some of it's not even they're, they're doing, it's just happening, you know, just because of, uh, you know, people's choices. And- uh, I love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the positive stories you're seeing in some of the countries that, that we need to be aware of that, that are doing this. It's nothing new. It's been going on for a while. Kind of give us some more hope and optimism, how we should see this discussion and, 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 and how, how we can do it. Where, 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 where. I, I think some people, when they even get in the discussion, not, not only religiously, cult, culturally, but it's just, it seems like such a hard thing and in, in your documentary you don't make it a hard thing at all you make it something that's a no-brainer kind of like okay yeah all right this is it's not that bad i thought it was a lot worse uh but you know, there are a lot of headwinds and uh you know in the documentary the, the one gentleman from population media center talks about you know the economics and the politics and that you know there's this narrative out there that says you know, we must have more people because that means more growth and a better society for all. But as you said, you know, look at the, 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 the infrastructure needs and the healthcare needs and the education needs of this growing populace. It's an enormous strain on society and the infrastructure from the transportation needs. It's an enormous uh, 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 impact on society and, and also the environment. So, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a, it's a, you ha we have to shift that narrative and I think economists have to start to look at, you know, is it all about growth and exploitation of resources and go down with the ship or how can we balance what we have in nature and live within, you know, what nature can provide us and, and that's, that's, that's a shift that has to happen uh, at a at a, certainly at a granular level, Mark, uh, meaning we all have to feel that and then we all have to voice that. And then I think politicians will react and the, and the globe will react to the global society will react as well. But we are the ones that have to understand that. And that's what I a lot about what you're doing and others as far as trying to help move the, move the, you know, move the needle there. I like the way you answered. You, you kind of said, you know, none, none of the plans out there, none, nothing that we're describing is really... <clears throat> It's working 
because look at history, look at look at how, how we've done it in the 35 times before, how we've done it in in all the years, where are we going? And and you know, we're breathing the same air and, and drinking the same water that Gandhi did, that uh Caesar did, you know, who, who, whoever the famous person you want to see. And uh, um, uh, reminds me of Gandhi. I mean, he did amazing things, uh, colonialism, and a lot based around food. And 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 um, at the end, we couldn't come together. Those religious, those cultural, couldn't come together. And and yeah, they overcame colonialism, but then they're just right back into um, the same bad situation. And uh, we're not learning from our lessons. We're kind of repeating the same mistakes. Einstein's problems theory that you mentioned earlier, you know, um, <clears throat> we have to look at our problems differently than when we created them. And uh, that's how we'll, we'll solution, uh, come up with those solutions. I really like how the whole documentary moves us in, in that right, uh, right area. And um, there are a few other documentaries I told you about mine, but there's that are, they're kind of emerging out there. Another one's Endgame 2050 with Moby. And I, I forget the doctor's name. She's also wonderful from um, Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, and um, that, that's a wonderful thing. The reason I, I bring up these documentaries, and so I, I believe on the educational journey, on this journey to uh, envisioning a different future, envisioning some tools, tips, and tricks of how we get there. My big question or pet peeve or thing that I kind of want to work in, I want to discuss this with you, not only because you're a producer and educator and you created this wonderful documentary, is if, if I go to the movie theater, if I go to Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever, and, uh, uh, even before the pandemic, and I want to I want to see a vision of what that sustainable future, that resilient future looks like, what 2030 will look like, what 2050 will look like. Excuse my French, Jesus, it's pretty, it's pretty scary because everything I see out there is very dystopian. We're fighting over some resource or fighting each other. It's Mad Max, it's Total Recall, you know, whatever. It's it's pretty dystopian. I can't think of too many beautiful depictions of of those times in the future and how we're how that feels like a, a vision of what it feels like and how we're going to get there you you dated yourself i'm also in the same area as you are we're both uh, up there in age and when i was younger there was star trek and these these they were sci-fi but they were, you know, a, a non-smoking future. It was a future with no, uh, not money as an economic model. There was a different economic model. There was transporters and food generators. And, and it was, and a lot of those things we kind of came up with and gender diversity and, and interracial marriages, all sorts of things, uh, relationships that, that we learned from that. And, and because of those visions, I would say because of those visions, we were able to engineer, architect, create, and design, say, oh, I like what I saw in Star Trek. I want to create that for the future. I would really like a tricorder or a cell phone, smartphone, whatever, 3D printer. And, and I'm, I'm bound and determined, let's make that happen. I don't have any media besides maybe a TED Talk and dystopian Black Mirror and, and no real visuals, media of showing me how in the hell can I get to that future? How can I engineer, create, architect, design, get to that future? And when, when it comes, it comes in the form of what we see these documentaries and they're one and two off and they're competing against all sorts of stuff that's really feeding our amygdala. Wouldn't it, how, how would you feel if we had a few TV series that really showed us a, a sustainable future, what it looks like to live in, a future of 100% renewable energy, no fossil fuels, 100%, no poverty, no hunger. What, how would it feel if we had series that showed everyday interaction life and maybe even if it was movie magic that we could kind of feel what that would feel like to be there. So I want to get your take and your feeling uh, because right. you have a heck of a lot more experience in this area than I do. Why can't we do that? Yeah, I think what, what if, if I understand you, what you're trying to describe is hope. And uh, exactly. I, I think, uh, 
And that's, uh, uh, there are a lot of people, uh, a lot of ecologists that I, and, and scientists that I, you know, communicate with online through these list serves, Mark. And, um, you know, there is, you know, very, very guarded optimism uh, uh, just uh, because their concern with the human condition is we're not uh, wise enough, we're clever, but we're not wise enough to, you know, look into the future, as you're saying, like Star, you know, like Star Trek and all these other future uh, scenarios and to uh, be able to say, well, if we want to see this future and this path, here are the uncomfortable things that we have to do now. And no one really wants to, you know, delay gratification. They want immediate gratification. They want, you know, the the stuff that we have, and they're not willing to give up that stuff. So, I, I think it's going to be very, very challenging. And I just hope that we can do it in a way that is graceful. You know, I I, I need to work on these numbers, Mark. But from what I can read and understand is that, you know, if we were able to get the global fertility right now, which is about 2.45 children per per woman. If we were able to get that down to, you know, one child or 1.5, you know, within a fairly short time, meaning a few generations by the end of this century, uh, we could be down to a population that may be sustainable based on our current lifestyles. Um, so, you know, it is doable, uh, and it, it, it's just it's like the Titanic. It, it just it, it takes an enormous amount of time and energy to make that shift a, at a global level. And, uh, you know, everything that you and I do can cascade. So, you know, what you're doing is wonderful. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do, I hope, is wonderful. And, uh, you know, the more people that, uh, you know, the, and I think the bioethicist says this in the film, that the more people who are talking loudly and often enough about whatever it is, you can then begin to see changes. So uh, I hope that uh, we'll see more changes that uh, will put us towards that sustainable future at the uh, requires sacrifice. Uh, it requires uh, recognizing that, you know, uh, we have a certain carrying capacity here on the planet and we have to make sacrifices to live within that carrying capacity. It's not something that we're going to want to do, but we need to do. Yeah, I, I, I love how you say it's hope because it really is in many respects. And I, I'm, I don't mind using movie magic to not just give us that hope, but to show us what what that future would look like does it look something like from our childhood or or how nature used to look back in the 70s uh wh what does it look and feel like and 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 you know uh, do people not smoke there is there no more fossil fuels there's electric vehicles whatever it is but just even show us that on a steady basis on a series all different languages so that we can even envision not really show us how to get there it's okay for it to be movie magic, but then I would think, wouldn't we want to say, boy, that right now what I'm seeing on other channels, other media or whatever, is, it's not really what I want. And so it scares me. I put my head in the sand, the number, the data, the charts, the statistics, it's all overwhelming. And so I feel overloaded. I just am tired and depressed. I don't even want to watch it. But if I show, saw something different and, and it wasn't the, the human interactions were maybe a little bit more improved. That human condition was different. Um, one of hope. I mean, the, the, uh, is the human condition, is that hope? Is that, uh, or, or is it really, uh, I mean, you kind of surmised it a little bit when you, you when you touched on that. I, I, why can't we, why are we so divided? Why can't we even movie magic have that and then say, we're going to figure out a way, a path or engineers, inventors, social entrepreneurs, filmmakers like you. So, okay, well now we're doing these projects. Anyway, I, I know we can't solve these problems, but I, I would just love that our documentaries, our, our visions of the future uh, were, sh were shown to give people some, some of that hope, some of that vision so that they can, their creative humanity is so creative that they can engineer and, invent and create those i know we can achieve it um i don't know how but i know we can but yeah so um i don't know if you have anything else to say that i just i think you're right i think you're right people want a vision of a future that's cheery that's uh hopeful and that, that doesn't require sacrifice um i do think uh that we do need to be told the truth and that there may be sacrifice that needs to be done and uh, i just hope that we can you know be you know uh you know uh 
go through that in a way that we look at the positives in it and uh, find the happiness where it exists and, uh, you know, continue with, as you said, a resilient, uh, you know, uh, outlook on life. And, uh, and you know, there wasn't, you know, the, the folks who lived before fossil energy, you know, living in uh, and in the hunter-gatherer societies, they lived good lives. They didn't have all the health care that we might have today and some of the other doodads and knickknacks and, and, and contraptions, but, you know, they lived happy lives. And so we don't need a lot, but we have a lot. And uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to, you know, willingly wean ourselves from that. But, uh, you know, as, as it happens to us, because nature won't be able to provide it, hopefully we can recognize that and go through that process with, you know, a, a good heart and, uh, you know, hope and, and a, a, you know, a positive outlook. I have uh, four last questions for you. The, <laughs> the next one is the hardest question that I will give you today. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, although maybe you've been saying that as well. Um, it's what's the future's What's the futures? Where are we going? What's your vision? What's your hope? Um, what if you were to give us a little vision of what your futures are? What are they? Share them with us. Uh, I have no idea what the future, you know, uh, will will you know, unfold and how it will unfold. Um, I, I, you know, certainly want to live a, a life that's closer to the earth. Uh, that uh, you know, I. I, I uh, live in the suburbs of a city and uh, looking to move in the next year or two to a more of a rural region and to be closer to nature and to uh, do more, you know, uh, work with the land uh, and be less reliant on, you know, outside systems. And, uh, you know, I hope uh, people do that. I hope they get back to the earth and I hope they, um, uh, you know, see the value in nature. And it's hard in a city environment for people to see the value in nature. They just haven't been around it. And many people are born. And that's a paradigm problem, Mark. You know, it's like you and I uh, remember when there was a lot more greenery in nature around us and abundance of biodiversity. And, uh, but if you're born today, you, you really, this is your paradigm that you know. And so it's, it's a different way of uh, looking at it. And I hope we can educate the youth today to, to see that uh, you know, there's a balance there with our, our, our planet and, and an important one that we need to work with. If there was one message you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Um, you know, I, I would say having a small family is probably the most, it, it is the most profound action by far that an individual can undertake toward fixing the, you know, climate, uh, uh, healing the environment and uh, improving both uh, their lives and, and the animal world. What should young producers, directors, innovators, sustainable activists, environmentalists in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Um, certainly connect emotionally with the viewers. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, approach everything with passion and dedication and determination. I think, uh, you know, persistence and determination are, are omnipotent. Uh, we, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a critical uh, feature and there are gonna be a lot of people who will, as you know, Mark, will uh, you know, have a target on your back and uh, you just have to, you know, know that what you're doing is, is right and, 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 uh, uh, and with, you know, with the, the deepest, uh, you know, ethics and the deepest uh, um, belief and uh, doing the right thing by others. And the last question is really, what have you experienced or learned in your journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? You know, I, I came to the film, Mark, with a deep concern for the natural world. And uh, what uh, unfolded to me through this process of making the film was the enormous um, uh, impact that uh, unsustainable population growth has had on human health. As you saw with India and the, the number of people who are dying annually for just from, you know, uh, um, you know, the polluted air or the polluted water that they drink. Um, 
to the you know human health costs that come from high housing costs. Like they look at California and, and people having to commute long distances, but when they're you know paying enormous amounts for rent or, or purchase prices, that they're sacrificing maybe with their health care, they're sacrificing with the nutrition. Uh, or if you look at what's happening with CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and you know that 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 descends on our crops and it actually changes the nutritional value of many crops and uh, uh, or, or it, uh, it can impact us in, in, in other ways, health-wise. So uh, I, I never really saw and understood the human health toll that uh, you know, population growth has, but it's enormous. And uh, it, was a, it was revelatory to me. And uh, the solutions were revelatory as well, which were wonderful. And as you said, with like Paul Hawkins' book, you know, it was, I think it was revelatory to him where you know, the number six and number seven of the top 10 strategies to fix climate change we're educating girls and uh, uh, you know providing a, a universal access to modern day contraception and those two when combined were the number one solution so uh, I, I guess uh, that's that's uh, that's my thought that that's a good thought and thank you for sharing that for those are all the questions I have for you today and I've <clears throat> just sheerly, so thankful for your honesty and openness and that we could get into some depth and, and have a nice exchange. Is there anything before I say goodbye that you would like to depart or say that we didn't get a cover or that we kind of skipped over or missed that, that we need to know or did we, did we get a pretty good ground today? I think this, it was great, and I really appreciate your your interest in, in uh, you know exploring these uh, deep issues and uh, systemic issues. And uh, I would say if there are you know, viewers out there are interested, they can certainly learn more about the film at the you know our website, which is uh, eight billion. That's the number eight billion angels dot org, and uh, or they can also go to our nonprofit, which is earthovershoot dot org. And uh, at both those uh, areas, they can certainly learn more about, you know, what we've discussed today for the last hour. So we'll put all the links and all that into the show description notes and links and, and, and things and give that to them. Terry, thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure and I wish you a most wonderful day on today, May 5th, Earth Overshoot Day for, for Germany. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>